Hello, my name is Will and this is Crazy Talk Analytics. And in this video, we're going to be talking about loan amortization schedules. We have a few talking points here worth um, mentioning as far as what the plan is and see how well we actually stick to it. So we're going to attempt to create a loan amortization schedule without using VBA. And we're gonna kind of wing it a little bit. I've done it a few times. I have an idea how we're gonna proceed, but I never really know what's gonna go on the spreadsheet until I actually start doing it. Sometimes I surprise myself with what pops into my head. Um, automate creating new loan amortization schedules with VBA. So after we've done it manually through just you know entering formulas and cells, etc., uh, then we're gonna see how we can automate that process. Let's say that we wanted to just enter information into a summary table and then populate the spreadsheet. And then we're going to, if we have time permits, uh, if time does permit, we're going to look into creating a loan object class in VBA. So VBA is object oriented programming language that focuses on essentially, gosh, I'd hate to say exploiting objects, but basically you manipulate the objects, right? And an object has um, properties, which are sort of these attributes or characteristics, and they perform methods. So for a loan, some of the properties might be things such as the principal, the rate and term might be properties or characteristics of a loan. Um, and then methods might be things like the actual amortization or payment or something or to pay a loan uh, or apply payment. You can really get creative with it. So one of the things that's not on here because I don't know that we'll get through all this today is or in this session is then taking that loan object and pulling it into Microsoft Access. Now you don't have to have these, you, you don't have to use VBA at all for Microsoft Access. So I don't want to think, I don't want you to think that it's a more complicated application than it is. But I think that you can really um, take Access and turn it into a proper application if you fully utilize VBA. So. I've been using Access for a long time. I've only been learning or using VBA for a short time uh, relative, let's say. I've been using Access for hmm, definitely close to 15 years and uh, possibly more. And I've only been um, experimenting and really learning a lot about VBA over the past four years or so. So just to give you an idea, there's a lot you can do without it, but so much more you can do with it. Let's head over to our words of uh, words of warning. I almost said a words of wisdom. So this is where I would recommend you pause and take a look. I'll, I'll discuss a few of these briefly, but you know I'm not gonna go over them in detail. So um, take a look at the screen and see if this is something that you wanna proceed with. And you know, do proceed with caution. I always enjoy and appreciate when people continue to watch, but videos will be long, I'll talk a lot probably make mistakes and also I'm kind of a recent lightweight drinker and I'm having a beverage it is late don't think it's don't think it's not an appropriate time but yeah that's going on and it's going on off camera so there shouldn't be a problem so let's go back over to our ITPs I'm assuming you've had a chance to look this over so we're gonna start off creating a loan amortization schedule now this is really just a schedule uh, that takes a loan and applies your monthly payments to it over time, reducing the balance. And what's great about this is you could take some of the values, such as your your principal, uh, your interest, the the interest rate, uh, and the term, and the number of periods, or yeah, that's essentially what the term is. And you can calculate that schedule out so you understand how long it's going to take, what the loan's going to look like, what your interest payments are, etc. So let's let's go ahead and pop in a new spreadsheet and just kind of get started. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started and actually creating a loan amortization schedule here on this wonderful new, fresh, empty spreadsheet. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. That's just entering control and scrolling up on my mouse and I am using a Windows um, system not any of that that Mac or Apple crap that some people use hopefully I didn't offend anybody there 
I'm not, I'm not a Windows supremacist. It's just that you know, Windows or IBM clones or whatever you have them, they just happen to be better. It's kind of a fact. So we're gonna go ahead and just enter. Well, let's enter some values in here. So we want our uh, principal or our loan principal amount. Um, you don't have to enter in the specific exact about the the uh, exact terms here if you if you don't want to but you know there's some flexibility there we have our rate our basically let's say this is the um, annual rate or your APR we're not looking for APY or anything and then we have our term which will be in term of months so one thing to note here is that the uh, the annual rate is an annual value and our um, our term or loan periods will be monthly. So we need to put these both on the same page and not just the same spreadsheet page. So our principal amount, let's say, is $15,000 and our annual rate, let's whatever, just make something up 10%. You can enter whatever values you'd like to here. If you wanna enter actual values for a loan you have, by all means, go ahead and do that. The term, is what uh, it could be anything but i'm going to go with 48 um, months which would be four years i'm also going to rename this spreadsheet I'll call it car loan very succinct to the point to the point i'll get my i'll get my act together tonight i promise or i won't i don't know um hopefully it'll be entertaining in some way if not in terms of actual uh, valuable content that you can use. So let's calculate a payment. And by calculate, um, I just mean we're going to use a function that's going to do all the heavy lifting for us. So equal PMT. And what we want is the rate. Um, so these are the arguments that we need to pass. The rate, the number of period, the present value, future value, and type. Now, if you wanted to, we can go ahead and turn this little warning off. It's kind of a distraction. I think I need to get out of our formula here. And there we go, close that out. So I'm gonna enter this equals PMT. And if we click this little F of X, it's actually gonna open up our uh, this function argument dialog box. And we'll get information about each field if you're new to this. So the interest rate per period for the loan, for example, 6% divided by four for quarterly payments. Um, here we have monthly payments, so we want 10 divided by 12. So we can enter this and just do a divided by 12. And I pushed enter instead of tab, which was bad on me. So the number of periods is our month here and the present value is our principal. The future value will actually be zero. You can leave it blank. It's essentially the same thing. And for type, this is a logical value, which is true or false or zero one. And it says that zero, well, basically uh, a payment at the beginning of the period will equal one. And that would be what we call an annuity due uh, payments up front and payment at the end of the period, which is more common would be zero or omitted. So we'll just go ahead and put a zero in there for clarity. So this tells me that a $15,000 loan with a 10% APR paid over 48 months in monthly installments would have a loan payment of $380.44. The number shows up as a negative as it is a payment, which I typically am not like a huge fan of, but it is what it is and sometimes it works. So let's go ahead and put in, we'll say our period here. So we're gonna have 48 periods, and I know I don't do things the most efficient way possible. Uh, I'm gonna change this format before I drag this down. So we're gonna format cells. I'm going to click on custom, and we're gonna change this to double zeros. Uh, the period is gonna go into double digits most likely. Could be three digits. I like to keep my numbers fairly even. I'm not gonna use, uh, I seem to struggle whenever I use this fill function that should be able to take the numbers down to a specific value. In this case, that would be 48, but I always have issues with it. So 
we're just going to use this uh, value represented there so we see that as we drag it kind of gives you a prediction of what that cell is and we're just going to go ahead and do this as such now I'm purposely leaving off dates for this and we can get into that later I mean dates aren't that hard you can do uh, functions that easily calculate dates based off of putting a starting date in here and then you can predict the payment date but the problem with putting payment dates definitively here is that if there's an error if you basically if you rely too heavily on the amortization schedule that wasn't generated by um, by the lender directly then you say that the payment is due on this date or this is a period end date but you've calculated it incorrectly yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't want that responsibility right now so it could be there for general awareness or for maybe translating the payments over to sort of a budget or forecast schedule or something so there is value there but right now I'm just gonna go ahead and leave it off so we have our period and we have our beginning balance we have the interest which gets accrued and then we have the payment which gets applied now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna actually say calculated payment and this is uh, one of those things where you can diverge a bit and what actually is going to go down here on on the sheet maybe isn't what I had planned so we're gonna have calculate calculated payment and we're gonna have um, alt payment so basically your value is gonna be one or the other it's not gonna be both and this is just gonna give us an option to override the calculated payment and then we're gonna have our ending balance I'm not gonna put in anything here that's gonna account for fees or penalties we're going to assume all loan payments are on time. Um, if you do expect you're going to have problems making the payment, it's really just another uh, field or another column that you would add. You just, again, have to make sure that you're adding it at the appropriate time, whether that um, penalty is being added after the payment or before, etc. probably doesn't make a world of difference. But anytime you start adding more more values or more variables here you just want to make sure that you're doing it in the appropriate order so let's i'm just going to go ahead here and uh, resize things a little bit make them a little bit more palatable so let's actually call this pmt just to shorten it a bit just like the actual function itself was and we're going to We'll go ahead and uh, move this over. Uh, this is we're really just getting into um, aesthetics at this point. Actually, I'll pull this in, slide that over, and this is one of those things that sometimes you'll just have to put up with uh, watching me do, which could be a little bit annoying, I know. So the 15,000, we'll convert that to a proper number format. Typically, you're not going to have to worry about decimal points in the actual loan value. And then the APR will go ahead and add a few zeros, as that could actually be a thing. You could have 10.075% loan. And then our, our loan payment here, which is actually a calculated amount. All right. So pardon me for a moment. I think the key to making successful videos, I hope, and we'll see how this um, turns out, is to lose all inhibition. I've been trying to make videos in the morning, record content in the morning, and I'm usually kind of stressed and um, and and not, not not imbibing at that time. So I don't know, maybe that's not working for me. We'll see. So we have our we have all this stuff, and now we're ready to do the calculations. It'll get fun when we hit into the VBA. I love I love VBA personally. So um, our beginning balance is this fifteen thousand, and we don't need to lock that reference because the first row here is actually going to be different than the other rows, and that this is the only one that's going to reference the values in the top, um, and then everything below it's going to ref reference the row immediately above it. So our interest is going to equal the beginning balance, and then we want to multiply that by our annual rate 
divided by 12. So again, we're getting back to that monthly interest rate. So $125 interest. Uh, way too many decimals there. We're fine with something like this. Now, for all of these values, perhaps perhaps having the full decimal uh, point may be, may be appropriate. So our calculated payment would be this value. So we can just say equals this. And the alternative payment would be whatever alternative value that you wanted to put in um, opposed to the calculated payment. So our ending balance, so we are making the formula just a little bit more complicated, would be equal to, so what we would actually be able to do, and I have a plus sign here, they're actually interchangeable to a degree, but what we, we would have been able to do without the alt payment is uh, just straight across said sum these values, and that would be our ending balance that we can bring down. But by putting an alt payment in here, well, actually, we might still be able to do that as I think about this. Um, what we can do is we can make the calculated payment contingent on whether or not there's an alt payment value before it references this. So how we would do that is we would say equals, and there's so many ways to do things in Excel. That's one of the um, amazing parts of it, right, is that it's all about um, your thought process as you approach it at that particular point in time. There's so many different ways. So if we say if F9 equals uh, double quotation marks, which basically means if it's blank, um, then we're going to equal this calculated loan payment. Now, there is one more thing. Uh, otherwise, we're going to enter, believe it as a zero or a blank spot. So there is one other thing, which is um, the alt payment right now needs to be a negative value. So we have that, it actually doesn't come across in the red in the same format. So I just did, I just clicked on this, did the format painter, and uh, so sampled that for the format and then painted it here. So we have the, the red for the negative numbers. So the only issue with this is if you wanna enter the payments as a positive number, basically if you don't wanna to have to always go in and enter them as a negative. So we could account for that just by having this field subtracted instead of added, but I'm gonna leave it this way for now. Payments will always have to be a negative. So if you enter an alt payment, it'll remove the calculated payment, and then you'll just have that. So there, I suppose it doesn't even matter if your alt payment is less, um, that wouldn't make sense. So we should be good here. So I'm going to then take this sum and actually click this box, this outline to include the alt payment. So by summing these values now, the ending balance should be fairly appropriate. So now the next row, we will say this beginning balance equals the ending balance. And then our interest, this is actually um, a constant formula, so go down. So we need to make this D4 value here an absolute reference. So we can do that by locking that in using the F4 to toggle the absolute value and that will put a dollar sign, it should be easier to see now. A dollar sign in front of the D and the four, and that gives it an absolute reference, and then divided by 12. We drag that down, and that should work. So our interest payment has gone down because we've paid off some of the balance. Our calculated payment is referencing F9. Again, we wanna make that an absolute reference, so I'm gonna go ahead and push F4, and then over here as well. Um, this G, what is it, it says, G8, so if F9, so F9 is actually not absolute. Let's change that. I'm gonna push F4 again to toggle it. Now we're in a mixed reference, F4 again, another mixed reference, and then one more F4, we've cleared our absolute reference. So it's the red up here, the actual loan payment that I need to make absolute. I'm gonna push F4 to toggle that. You can see it kind of updating down here. Push enter. And now if I bring this down, um, rather the, the formula is over here. If I bring this down, that should work. So if I delete this value, we should be good to go. So if you want to override the calculated payments, all you have to do is enter a value in the alt payment. Just bring this formula down as this references everything to the left. So the relative formulas change in relation to your cell and the absolute just locks those references 
so that the relation of the cell isn't that important as as much as the absolute reference of what you're what you're referencing <laughs> okay so now we're just going to highlight that row or that sl that selection and then drag it down. We will clear this alt payment here so that we have our calculated payment all the way down. And then we'll just bring it. And this should get us pretty close to zero. So we have that. Now one of the things we will note here is we probably don't have a perfect um, dollar value here for all practical sense. It looks like it, but it might not be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say round to two spaces. And then I'm just going to double click down there to bring it down. So now we have a penny. So with the penny, uh, what we want to do probably is say this is 380.44, which probably rounding this is probably the issue as well. That's, that might be where some of the variations come in. So around that to two spaces, we come all the way down and um, 380.37. So now we have a negative seven cents variance. So 380.37 was what the balance was after we've applied interest. We don't have a separate column just for that subtotal. I don't think it's necessary. But three dollars and three hundred eighty dollars and thirty-seven cents. But we're paying three eighty forty-four. So really, this calculated payment at this point really only has to be the minimum in terms of an absolute reference. It would be the maximum in this case. But what I would do is I would compare these two values, the calculated value and this value, and only apply the absolute minimum. And that absolute term just makes it a little bit easier. So. What I'm going to do here then is say equals, um, so let's put it this way. So if, if F56 is blank, then we're going to enter the value and that's going to be a negative of basically, so we want to say negative and then we're going to compare them. So the negative parentheses, so we're going to return one of two values. And we're going to say minimum of absolute sum of these values or the second number would be this number here. Um, again, we're we're looking for an absolute. So we're applying an absolute to both of them. We could have done that just by uh, making it a maximum instead. Okay, so we have a problem. So the formula is getting a little wonky here. So we have a parentheses, a parentheses. So we have four opens five opens we definitely don't have enough closes let's go ahead and put one more closing parentheses there and that didn't no all right so let's let's do something i'm sitting kind of far from the screen as i tend to do so this is what we're going to do we're going to break this out separately um so we're going to say equals so we're just gonna equals minimum of Actually, this is, yeah, we don't need to absolute this. This is straight up. So minimum of sum here or absolute here. And this is the one we want to do an F4 on to lock that. So 380.37. And then that, we're going to make that a negative value. We're going to apply the formatting here, cell formatting there. So we're in the same format. And then we're going to take this, and what we can do now is drag this down, and then take this value. This um, was a G3 that that's referencing that solid value, that absolute reference there, 
and we're going to paste that um, formula in there. So basically, if f56 is blank, then we're going to perform this calculation. Otherwise, we're going to put a blank value in there. And then that should work. Now we bring it up. Unfortunately, there's no quick click and drag to like a quick populate the formula up. You can only populate it down. So this works. Now we're going to have a problem. Um, actually, we shouldn't have a problem. Let's say that we did a $500 payment here. Well, we want that to be a negative. And we did this down. Hopefully what's going to happen is at some point right over here on period 47, we actually paid it off a bit early. So if we kept doing this and we did a negative 700 and then negative 800, we should see our amortization schedule sort of adjust. I'm not a huge fan of, <laughs> of those dollar signs. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this and that just kind of remove them by applying this, this comma style, which is kind of an accounting style. Very useful in my opinion. But that took away the red. It's fine. So let's go ahead and be consistent. All right. So our payments stand out. Now, we know all these are dollars. We don't need the dollars consistently throughout. I know that can be a point of contention for some, but let's face it, this is, this is probably better, easier to look at. So the actual periods themselves aren't gonna disappear. You could, hide those values if you wanted to, but I think we're good with this. And again, adding dates, not that complicated. You just want to make sure that they're right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert, I'm going to select this cell uh, or this row. I'm going to come up here to view and we will say freeze panes and we will just lock that in. So by selecting this range, and saying freeze panes. Now if we unfreeze, we'll free that up. Basically what we're doing is we're gonna freeze um, everything to the left and above the selection. And since there is nothing to the left because we've selected the entire row, it's only gonna freeze what's above. So that locks uh, our headers and we don't need so much space here. Let's just go ahead and bring that up and we can bring this up. I don't typically like uh, putting stuff right to the edge of the cell. It's kind of like like if you have a piece of paper, you're not going to start writing right on the edge, right? That's why we have our margins, uh, margarines, <laughs> our margins on paper and our borders, etc. So I don't really like having stuff right in the edge here, but sometimes that serves a purpose, especially when you're looking at raw data. So we have our principal, we have all these values here. We can add a whole bunch more things, but I think this will, for the most part, do it. We can pretty this up as much as we want to with formatting, but I'm going to call this good. Serves a purpose. And I do like the alt payment option here. So if you can be more, a little more progressive um, with your payments to reduce your overall interest, that would be great. So your interest as a whole, right, it's, it's going to be this column. So if you remove this, and one of the nice things about this approach, I remove that, and then we can just take a look at this and see what the total interest over the life of the loan would be. 326105. So a few issues with this particular approach, it's time sensitive. Now, granted, once you have the sheet, you should be able to copy, paste it over, and then, um, like for example, if we wanted to copy this loan for something else, we can just copy it over here come here and then say, well, it's $20,000 now at 15.53% for, what, 60 months. So our loan payments calculated and everything is good to go. But with the 60 now, we'd have to come down here and take this and then drag it down appropriately. It's not, it's not the end of the world. You could also drag this down way past uh, what you would need to be or what you would need for that current loan, you could take it down to like 120 or what would be a 30 year mortgage would be somewhat average. So if we said equal 30 times 12 would be 360, right? I mean, you could do that. 
if you really wanted to and then just have all those blank lines it just seems a little unnecessary and you also have to go down and just check these values to to you know make sure everything works well i mean even with a uh, vba approach you probably still want to do some double checking just to make sure because there's always the chance that um, there was an issue in, in the design of that code but I'm excited to get into the VBA part now. So I'm prettying this up as if this is the one, but this is car loan two. So I'm just gonna go ahead and actually delete that. And I'm gonna call this for that purpose. Just go ahead and say rename. I will actually give this a very clear car loan one sort of naming convention. That way I do have that option if I just wanted to just duplicate it or make a car loan two. And I'll go ahead and, and make this uh, bold. All right, so let's click save. And what we're gonna actually do is we're gonna save as because we're gonna start our, our macros, our VBA. So I, I, I mentioned this in the VBA overview video that the macros need to be saved in a macro enabled workbook. So let's just go over here, say save as and we're just going to save that. Okay, so now we have our XLSM file. Um, if you missed that, that's all I did was just selected the XM, XLSM macro enabled workbook format and then saved. And we should see something up here, I would have thought, but it looks like, okay, anyway, we're fine. So let's add a new sheet. And we're going to call this our loan summary. And some of the important data that we want that's going to allow us to populate our loans. Um, now, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. And this way might be somewhat more complicated, but it's kind of fun too. So, so we want our loan. We want our loan name. Uh, we'll do the principal. and we'll do the rate and the term. So I'm not gonna specify here, these are annual rates and monthly terms. These are things that can be specified, but for the sake of um, space and time, I'm gonna be somewhat, somewhat open about it. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to, well, let's put this, information in right so car loan 10 percent 40 a month so we'll take this text and we'll do a copy c and we'll put car loan um, principal was 15 rate is 10 percent and term is 48 we'll go ahead and bump up those decimals and we'll do this and this should be pretty pretty good and then what we're going to do is insert table. So table is an actual object. Um, it's an actual thing that exists in Microsoft Excel, right? So it's not just taking up space on the sheet. It's a definable object that has properties and, and does methods. So we can start to use that with our code. Range cell ranges themselves. Just this area is an object also. But it's a little bit more difficult to you know, depending on how much we have in here to sort of define or access that range. It's not, not crazy difficult, it, it's manageable easily enough, but I wanna make this a table. So what I'm gonna do is say, um, insert table, and this little dialog bo box pops up and it says, where's your data? Data's here, my table has headers, which it does. It's fairly accurate, so we're gonna click okay. So now I can change the aesthetics of this if I want to. We're, we're good with this, I think. Let me bring this up a bit. And you could reposition your columns. So um, if I wanna add a new loan, I can just tab here and that's going to add a new row in my table. So just merely by tabbing uh, like that, I'll do a control Z to undo. You can expand your table content. Your table by definition has a default name, which is somewhat bland and boring. In this case, it's table one. So if I select table one from my name box, that's what this is, it's not an address box, it's a name box. 
it'll actually take me to that table and select the data. So what I want to do is I want to rename that. I'm going to come up here to formulas, name manager, and here's our named reference. Hold on one second. All right, so here's our named reference. And what I'm going to do is change the name from um, table one, and I don't know what happened to it. There we go. I'm going to change the name to TBL. So we're using this naming prefix that still identifies it as a table, and we're going to call it loan summary. So now that's our table name, table loan summary. We close this. Now if we come up here, we'll see table loan summary appear, and it'll be selected. So now let's say we want car loan too, and let's say we're getting a nicer car here, $30,000. Um, we had trouble paying off that last loan, so 12.75% interest. And this might be, let's say 60, 60 months. Kind of want to kind of want to center this it's bothering me a little bit and we can um, we can center these as well all right so there's our car loan one and our car loan two and car loan one has a tab car loan two does not so I'm gonna go ahead and push alt f11 now to launch my visual basic editor so we have a few things going on here we have our um, our setup fairly well as we left off in the Visual Basic Editor overview. Um, we'll take a look at our tools to make sure that our options are set up appropriately. But we have our objects, our worksheets, and our workbook. So we see that Loan 1 is Sheet 5 and the Loan Summary is Sheet 4. These are the sheet names. I'm going to go ahead and oh, I double clicked, which opened up the module. I'm going to go ahead and just click on this, come down to the sheet four, and I'm going to call this sheet loan summary. Just give it a um, more sort of like a name that makes more sense, right? A more relatable name. I'm not going to name car loan sheet because these sheets are going to be added like crazy depending on how many loans we have. So I really just need this. And perhaps we can even say, um, sheet loans to make it shorter and easier to reference. Probably we can get away with putting most of the code on here, but uh, yeah, I think I think that would be fine for this purpose. So most of the code that's going to be executed to um, create the loan sheets, the individual sheets, we can have it live on this sheet loans module. Now you'll note we have option explicit up here, which is always the way I, I like to roll. I like to roll explicitly. So if we come up here to tools and option, you'll see I have this checkbox for require variable declaration. And that is going to put this text up here when you open or create a, a create a module, not open one. Um, if it wasn't there in the beginning, then you'll have to type it or get rid of it and then re-add it. So this is how I have my stuff set up. Tab with the four, auto indent, everything checked except for drag and drop text editing and auto syntax check, which I find more of a nuisance, um, more of a hinder than a help. So we're gonna go ahead and click okay. And I am gonna have to invoke my custom dark theme at some point. By the way, my co-pilot has arrived. So I'm no longer flying alone now, which is always nice. And now we're gonna start having fun. So what do we wanna do? Um, I played around with the idea at one point of copying or illustrating how you could copy an existing sheet, but that already tripped me up pretty fast. I'm not very good at copying sheets. <laughs> She's already started talking or groaning. And I'll be upfront with you. Like, there's some Excel stuff that I'm really good at in terms of manipulating Excel objects. Um, some I'm just not that good at. I don't do it very often. Primarily, I use VBA for custom custom code, custom classes, Microsoft Access, or manipulating ranges. Not so much for manipulating the worksheets that already exist in a workbook. So that's one of my weaknesses. Put out, put it out there. I'll learn um, as need be. But we don't need to copy a sheet here. Creating a new worksheet works totally fine for all practical purposes, and it'll it'll get the job done. Uh, when you do copy a sheet that has code on it, what's interesting is if we had code on this car loan one 
worksheet and we copied it, it would copy that code module as well. So that could be an additional benefit if you really needed that. Okay, so we're going to be using the immediate window. We're going to be using our, our um, sheet modules. We're going to be using all sorts of goodness. So how do we want to do this? Well, one of the first things that we need to do is we need to access the table, which now is called table loan summary on our loan sheet, which we've renamed sheet loans. We access that table and then we access the body of that table. So that table is going to have different properties. It has a property for the header and it has a property for the body. The body is where the actual loan data is. And this body is actually a range object and ranges have um, basically rows and columns and cells. So we could have had it left just as a range and sort of define that and expanded on it. But by making it a body or by making it a um, a table, we just reference that table and then we just reference the table body and then we'll automatically be able to access all the rows in that body regardless of how long it is. And we do that, let's call this public sub and we'll just call it auto loan, not the most creative name and it might change at some point. So we're going to declare a variable um, let's just call it LO for list object. So a table object in Excel is a list object type. I don't know why, don't ask me that, it's just the way it is. There's a lot of this stuff you just learn through trial and error research or whatnot. So dim LO as list object. So we're saying this variable, this LO variable, which we require because we have option explicit, we're requiring variable declaration this LO is going to contain a list object. So in this case, we're going to say set LO equal to um, sheet loans dot list objects. So what we're doing here is we're accessing the list objects collection, which is a property of sheet loans. Now, since we've specifically named this sheet, we can reference it this way to make it easier. Now we could pull an index and it's probably index zero or something because it's the only list on there, but I'm going to pass the name that we gave it, which is TBL loan summary. And you could typically retrieve items from certain lists by passing the name instead of the index number. And if we just run this code and all we have to do is push play, we should hopefully cross our fingers, not get any error messages. Now, if we do a uh, debug dot print lo dot data body range dot address. So the data body range, so we have two different things, right? Let's take our lo. Our lo, we have uh, the list object, we have our header row range, that's just one row, and then we have the data body range. So you can kind of tell what each one is, the header data and the data body range, which is your data there. So if we wanted to say we want the rows of the data body range and we want the count, we can sort of pull the thread on all these properties. So we're getting the number of rows that exist in the data body for the list object. And we're going to use this debug.print to return that number to our immediate window. We should get the number two. And that's exactly what we get. So we have our data body range. Now what we want to do is we want to go through each row and check to see whether or not a sheet exists for that loan name. So we can do that just by accessing the first cell of each row. And then what we need to do is iterate over all of the worksheets in the workbook and see if a sheet with that name exists. And I know this is where I struggled before when I tried to do this, but I think I'm a little bit more prepared at this point in time. So hold on one second. All right, so we're going to um, be iterating over this data body range. So how do we do that? Well, see how we're doing on time. Well, we're not doing great, but we're not doing terrible. So. I'm going to go ahead and just comment this out uh, for now, and I'm noticing I don't have my toolbars, so there's my edit here. 
let's go ahead and drag that in there. So I'm just going to comment that out. So what we want to do now is then uh, we need a few things. We need a WS object to store our, our WS variable to act as a worksheet object. And we're also going to do our as, you know, I'm just going to do R as, as a range object. This is fine. There's so many different ways um, to do this. It, it's not a, it shouldn't be a big deal. So R is a range, WS has a worksheet. We're using very short named uh, variables currently. Hmm. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna enter a we're gonna enter a for loop. So for each R in LO dot data body range dot rows. So we're gonna start iterating over these rows that we just counted. So the way this works is for each row in the rows that are in the data body range. And that's how this is structured, right? So we have our, our table object, which is a list object. We're accessing the data of it, uh, the data body, and then we're accessing the rows of that. And then for every row or for every range, and a range is, or a row is a range, we're gonna perform an action. Whenever I do one of these loops, like a for each loop or something, I like to make sure that I end it. Um, and you end it by doing something like next R. So this closes the loop, and then the code in here is going to be what's repeated for each for each uh, sort of iteration or for each step through the loop. So if I wanted to say debug dot print R dot cells one, and what this is going to do is it's going to print the first cell in that row. So let's see what this looks like. We get car loan one and car loan two. All right, so instead of printing that first cell, let's go ahead and um, comment that out. So I'm just using this thing here, this comment block, just to quickly comment out the, the lines. So now we have that row and we know what that, that uh, first cell references the loan name. We can be, you know, we can make that, we can give that more variability if we wanted to, but you know, if we didn't know if that first cell was always going to have the loan name, but in this case we do, and we're going to keep things relatively simple. So now we're going to say, again, we're going to say for each WS in, um, let's say specifically this workbook, you don't have to do this, but this is fine, uh, worksheets. So for each worksheet in the worksheets of this workbook, and then we're going to say next WS. So now we say debug dot, well actually, if, if w dot, uh, if ws name equals um, this r dot cells one. So if the name of the workbook, which is the tab name essentially, or the name that we see here in parentheses, equals this, then we'll say, then debug dot print ws or let's go with the r dot cells is the same thing r dot cells um, and space found i don't need that parentheses there so if the worksheet name equals this the value in the first cell of the row that we're referencing then we're going to print that loan name and found And we're just using the ampersand to sort of do a quick concatenation. So this other loan, it wasn't found. So what I'm going to say here is um, WS is a, a variable that stores a worksheet. And as we're iterating through it, if we've iterated through all of them and it wasn't found, then we're still continuing on to the next row. But before we hit the next row, we can evaluate WS to see if it still stores a value, or if it has a value. Um, if we found it, then actually one of the things that we might want to do here, we're going to break this up. We're going to say if then, and we're going to put this on a separate line. So now we're in another block, but instead of a for block or for each block or loop, we're in an if block. I'm going to say end if, and this allows me to perform multiple commands for this action. So if we found um, the worksheet, we don't need to keep iterating over the worksheets. We've already found it. So we're going to exit the for loop. 
So this is going to pop out of this for loop. It's going to bring us into this much larger for loop here, which means it's going to execute whatever's on this line of code here. So what I would say here is debug.print type name ws. And this is going to tell me what type of variable or what type of value is being stored here in this variable. So first we expect to find car loan one, and then we expect not to find car loan two, but by both, in both cases, we should execute this line. So let's see what we get. So after we found car loan one, uh, WS stores a worksheet type. And the reason for that is because WS was assigned here. This equal sign is actually called an assignment operator. It's not something that says this value is equal to, to that value. Well, actually it is, I'm sorry, it is that here, but um, over here it's an assignment operator. So when you do each WS in the worksheet, it actually assigns that worksheet that it's iterating to over to the variable. So at that time, this WS variable actually has a value assigned to it. This is a equal thing though, I do apologize. That's, that's me just not knowing what I'm talking about right now. But when it exits the for loop, that WS variable is still storing that value. So when it hits the debug.print type name, it knows that there's a worksheet in there. But then as it starts to iterate over them again for the next R, um, the WS gets cleared. It doesn't find anything. It clears that variable name in code. So now when it tries to print the type name, for the second row, which it couldn't find the match for, it returns the value nothing. So the key here is that whatever code we're gonna to execute to add the loan that wasn't found on the table, we're going to execute that or trigger it when this variable equals nothing. So we're going to say if ws is nothing, then, and what we can do is probably, um, let's copy this and we'll comment this out and we'll say debug.print r cells not found. So we don't need to know that it was found. We only need to know if it wasn't found. So let's get rid of this and run it. Car loan two not found. So this is our tr key right here, right? This is, this is where we want to trigger um, the action or the, the, the code that's going to actually add our loan amortization schedule. And so what are we going to do now? Let me just put this over here. I know I, let me just undo this. So we're going to do, we're going to say add, um, add loan, right? So let's do another one. Public sub add loan. You might notice what I'm doing on these, and you don't have to enter the parentheses if you don't, it'll just add it for you. These are one line of text, one full string. So I have to use an uh, underscore or something to connect it. You can't put a space in there. It won't like that. So do keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that I am using indentation to space out my code to make it easier to read. For example, I'm indenting inside of the four, these four blocks, uh, for each block. So I'm indenting inside of the if blocks. So, and I'm also indenting inside of my sub procedures. All of this makes the code easier to read at a glance uh, versus having something where it's all, let me see if I can illustrate it. I mean, imagine if it looked kind of like this. It would be a little harder to read, wouldn't it? So we'll set it back. I think it was here. So this definitely makes everything a, a bit easier to digest. Kind of like a digestive cracker or cookie. Give me the option of a digestive cracker or cookie. I'll take the cookie nine times out of ten. Unless it's a chocolate cracker. A chocolate-coated cracker. Okay. I get silly at night, I guess. So we're going to add a loan now. 
So we want to, um, all of our variables up here, they all live within this sub procedure. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare some new variables that are going to live in this other sub procedure. And we're going to say dem ws as worksheet. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to set ws equals to a new worksheet. And this new worksheet is where that loan is going to live. So we say set ws equals new worksheet. Actually, not even that. We're, we're going to use the worksheet collection. So that's worksheets. And then the worksheet collection has a, I think it's a, a method um, called add. So we see this here. Looks like a little green eraser being thrown. That's what I like to look at. Think of it as a, a chalkboard eraser or something. That's our action. That's our method. So worksheets is a collection. Um, you know, many different properties in a collection that you can reference by their index or name, but it's also kind of an object itself. Because we're assigning the value that gets returned, which the add method actually returns or creates a worksheet, we're assigning that to the variable, we need to use the parentheses. And it's going to be after um, something. And in this case, what we'll do is we'll say after the the loan sheet. So let's say sheet loans. And actually we want to specify it's not before, it's after. We can actually specify that by saying after equals uh, sheet loan. So we're actually putting it after an object. Uh, we should be able to leave all these other arguments or parameters blank. So if we do a debug.compile, it looks fine. So we're going to say if ws is nothing, we're not going to execute this anymore. I'm going to put a, um, I'm going to put this here. Hold on. Yeah, we need we need to finish this with an f oh, with the with a the block there. So I'm going to put the apostrophe here to start my code comment, but it still expects this code, uh, this if then statement to be finished. So we're going to say if ws is nothing, then we're going to add loan. So if we now if we run this and it doesn't find a loan, it's going to add a worksheet. It's going to add a worksheet, hopefully after our sheet loans tab. So I'm just going to move this over here and we're just going to push play. And there we go. Our sheet four got added afterwards. I'm going to delete it because we don't need it right now. We're not done with what we're doing. And we're going to bring this back. So one of the things I want is I want to um, pass a parameter to this new sub procedure. So we're adding a loan. And as you saw, it added a worksheet and it called it sheet four. But I wanted to pass that actual name. So when I add a loan, I want to pass the loan name that's in that first cell of that row. And we can do that by setting a parameter in here. So the sub procedure add loan, we're going to say string str um, loan name. The whole naming convention thing, I'll get into that. But I like to do the three letter prefix to indicate what type of value it is. This is a text string, so that would be an str. Now, there's a line of thought that says that, yeah, it's a good, it's a good um, idea to do that for declaring variables and codes, but maybe maybe the parameters, you don't need that. So I, I don't know. Right now I'm doing it. And we're declaring it as a string type. So we have an argument now. We need to pass it. So when we run this add loan, um, we're going to include r.cells.1. So again, this is comment um it's commented out with an apostrophe it's, it's in green it's not going to be executed i just left it there in case i want to pull it back in so it's going to add loan and it's going to pass this value now if i put a break in here that's what this dot does and then i run this we'll see if we hover over this we're getting this sort of this quick view that says r.cells1 equals car loan that's the value that would be passed I'm going to stop the code. I don't want to actually add that sheet yet. So far, so good. Remove my breakpoint. So now we're passing that variable and we're uh, creating a new worksheet and we're assigning it to this variable. So now what we can do is we can say with ws. Now, just like the for each and the if, 
the width has a beginning and end. So we're going to say width ws, and then we're going to say end width. So all the code that we put in between this will be executed with within this width block. So basically what we're saying is with this worksheet, we're going to perform the following actions. This is a convenient way of saying we don't always have to do things like say ws.name equals this or ws.range and the range is on this worksheet. Because we say the width ws, we can omit the ws on all our future references within this area. So I could say the name equals string loan name. And what it's going to do is it's going to change the name of that worksheet to the name that we passed. So now if I run this code, we see car loan two appear. I'm going to go ahead and delete it again. We should also be seeing, um, it's also going to appear up here in the objects over here, because it's an actual object that's getting added. So we add a name. Now we have a few other things. Um, cells these these cells or these ranges should have values and the values are being stored respectively and we're not going to go into a lot of detail and have it reference the rows we're just going to go straight up and say our principal is in cell two our rate is in cell three and our term is in cell four principal rate and term so um, we're going to leave this open for a reference. It's going to be in that order. And these are the cells that we want to populate. We want to sort of replicate this look. So we're going to say, uh, we're going to say dot range and let's say B2. So we're just going to do, um, actually let's do this cells reference. So instead of range, which, uh, pulls a specific range which could be a cell a row a column or whatever and you have to pass an address to it which is typically in that alphanumeric context like b2 uh, cells does the same thing it returns a range value too but uses a numerical reference so row would be second row and um, second column so two two and then what we're going to do is we're going to say equals principal amount and then we're gonna say dot oh, so we're gonna say cells uh, let's say um, still row two right so two and then one two three four and that's gonna equal um, actually what we can do here is we could pass this entire range reference so what we're doing right now is we're passing just the, the, the loan name as a string, but let's try something here. Um, so what we're gonna do is let's say row as range, and we're not gonna do it as a string anymore. And we're gonna say, so, Sometimes when you pass something like this, I think this might be fine. We might get a by reference error or something we will see. And that's because uh, variables can be passed as parameters as either references or values. A value will convert that number to a specific value, whereas a reference will still affect um, the object that's being passed. So we're just going to leave it at rows of range. And I think it's by reference by default. How you would set that is you would just say by ref like this or by value. And we'll go over in a future video the effects that these uh, two options have, but we'll leave that off. So we'll say row as a range. So now instead of passing r.cells1, we're just going to pass r as a whole. And instead of saying uh, we're just going to equal string loan name, we're going to see we're going to say row dot cells dot one and then this is going to equal the principal amount and now this allows us to access the other values such as row dot cells dot two uh, we just need cells oh we have an extra parenthesis here let's see how this works if it works 
Maybe I've made a mistake finally. I used to make so many mistakes when I started this. So it looks like it worked. Yep, totally worked. Um, zoomed out, but we got our values in there. So we're just gonna go ahead and we'll delete that. So passing that, passing that entire row object as a reference saved us from having to pass all the little um, the little parameters. So now we'll just go through. And I think we want one more. So we're gonna do uh, three and we're gonna do four. And this will be two, four, two, four. And then this here will be again two, but one, two, three, four, five, six. I think that's six and seven. So this will be, I think we did, we're calling it long payment. We're not gonna, I don't think we're gonna be able to get into formatting text today. We'll do that later. Honestly, I I'm, I'm don't know if I'll be able to um, finish all of this at all right now. This will be an interesting one here. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Principal amount, um, annual rate APR. And then this one will be term in months. So this is two, this is three, and this is four. So for the loan payment, this isn't something that I'm really happy about using right now, but for the sake of time and also for the um, informational aspect, I'll go ahead and throw it in. We're gonna access something called worksheet functions. Um, this actually homes all, this actually houses all of the functions that Excel has. So uh, any functions that you can enter on a worksheet, those aren't VBA functions. VBA has its own separate unique functions, but you can access this class, this, this object, if you will, and then you can access the functions through this, which are listed in here as I guess, uh, they look like methods, which I, I guess I'm, I always equate functions and properties and methods and some procedures, but that's this is how these are listed. So we can pull the PMT. It doesn't give you the defined parameters that you do, uh, that you have in, in this, unfortunately, but I'm pretty sure it was rate, months, future, present value, future value, um, and then your uh, argument five is, is your zero. So the rate, would be this one right here, row cells three. So we would have that. And that's gonna be divided by 12. Our um, term months here, and there are so many ways you can do this, honestly. And then the principal amount or the present value, and then this, and then this, and that should be fine. So let's see what we get now with this. Oh, we have to come up here, push this one. And there we go. Formatting's not there, so length is not there, but all the values are, are totally, totally there. So we're just gonna go ahead and delete that. So row six, Column two is where we start this information, period, beginning, balance, interest, etc. cetera. Um, so what I'm gonna do now, let me just slide this over, is I know there's there are definitely ways I would do this differently. I just, I know that. But here we go, <laughs> this is not ideal. Sometimes when you're tired, you do things in ways that you're just not so happy about. Um, cells six and then two. Um, so we'll say this equals something and then we'll do um, two, three, four, five, six, seven, All right? One, 
two, three, four, five, six. It goes up to seven, but it's really just six of them. Actually, this is actually getting very close to being done. So it's going to obviously put these values in there. There is no reason for it to not do that right now. Um, everything else has been working after that. So then what we want to do is we want to say, uh, we want to do a four, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to say four and then let's add a, a variable. We're going to use, um, I guess we can say I, you can do R again. We're going to mix it up right now because now the variable is going to be uh, what we call an integer. Right, an integer should be fine here. Integers go up to like values like from, I think, negative numbers to 256,000. And we're not going to have more than that in terms of period. So we're going to say i as integer. i is a classic, um, it's a classic iterator that we can use. We can call it r2 to refer to a row, whatever. It doesn't matter what we call it. So now we're going to say for i equals, and it's going to be row seven, right? So let's say six, um, let's say for i equals one, uh, two, and I can't, I can't type here, t zero. I don't know how that happens. Um, and then what we want is the number of months, which is in this reference here having variables for these specific references might not be a bad idea um, makes them easier to understand what's going on the fact that we have the um, header or the actual sort of like the field reference right before it kind of makes this easier to find so it's not terrible so for i equals one to in this case 60 right because that's the value that's in that cell so for each value from one to 60 what are we going to do and then we're going to say next i. So we're going to say um, cells. So the row is what's going to change. And six is where our header was. So if we say six plus i for our row, and then the column is going to be two, which is going to be the period, we'll say equals i. So that gives us our period value. Um, the next thing we need is our beginning balance. So we want to track the balance. We're going to need a variable for that. So we're going to say, um, in this case, we're going to use a currency type. So we're going to say currency balance as uh, currency. And then what we're going to do is we're going to actually assign that variable um, when we do the principal amount here. So we'll just insert this here just to keep it consistent. Currency balance equals row cells two. All right. And I guess we could also let's yeah, let's do our variables here. They're, they're going to make things easier. Um, we're going to say DBL interest as a double this is a double floating point integer which is basically a decimal value um, probably could use decimal also for this but this should be fine so we're gonna say dbl interest equals row cells a3 so our beginning balance, right, will equal the the balance, which is fine. So we're gonna say dot cells again. 
um, 6 plus i and uh, 3 now equals um, so the cur isn't current it's currency current balance and then what we're going to do now is say interest so interest equals a current balance times the rate so we're going to say dot six plus and we could assign this to a variable also like a relative row reference equal to this so we don't always have to do the six plus i but it's not the end of the world equals current balance times dbl interest and the next thing that we have is our uh, our calculated payment so this this is a tricky one in terms of replicating what we have there so the interest all of these values right now they're going to be static and I'm just going to tell you right now um, actually I'm going to remove the alt payment just for the sake of time here and we're going to make this six and we're not going to do the alternative payment for this we'll um, I want to call this video I want to show demonstrate how this can be done and then we'll pick up in another video in terms of adding the alternative aspect just because we're short on time right now so we're just going to do our current balance and uh, basically our current our balance our interest payment the calculated payment which is going to be where is it up here our loan payment here. So let's actually do another variable to make that easier to reference. All right, so what we're gonna do is um, so we're gonna say currency actually we're going to assign the value of this variable here to this. We're going to say currency payment equals this formula. And by the way, now that we have some of these here, we could say interest um, would DBL interest is actually row cells three divided by 12 because it's the monthly interest so then we can take this and we could put that there and this is the term I believe and this is um, the payment or the balance and then that's our future value so we then replace the term uh, but we can use these new variables that we have to fill in these values and then we could say this cell now equals that all right so now we want our calculated payment so we can just say dot cells six plus i five equals the current payment and now we just need our um, end balance so our current balance now is going to be less the payment so we say see our current balance equals current balance minus um, currency uh, payment so this is what I was getting at before this in this case it's not a equals to it's an assignment operator so we're taking current balance which is 30,000 whatever minus the payment and then we're taking that value and we're assigning it to the variable again so we're overwriting that value the ending balance is going to be equal to that so uh, cells six very repetitive in this case Again, not ideal, I'm not super happy. So now this value will be that, and then when we go to the next row, the next I rather in this case, because our rows are being incremented by virtue of increasing I and referencing that row value on that corresponding, um, that cell, right, that cell reference on the worksheet. So that term is gonna be, that month is gonna be I, it's gonna go up. And the, current balance the currency balance I should say is now going to be the new balance because this variable is being overwritten so when it comes back up here for the next iteration this value 
um, is now the last stored updated value. So what we're gonna have with this, this should go all the way down to 60 and it should calculate pretty well. We didn't do the rounding, we'll worry about that later. Um, and we don't have any functions or any live updates. So these are gonna be static values that we're not gonna be able to change just by plugging in a alternative payment. But let's see, right? In terms of providing somebody with an amortization schedule, um, this should work unless I missed mess something up. So here we go. All of that work was done instantly. We have period one through 60. We're applying our payment. And uh, we're subtracting the payment, which is a negative number. Um, so it came back to bite us in the bottom there. So all we want to do is add the payment and hopefully that fixes this mistake. Let's see, and then we can call it a day. See how fast this happens though? Come up here and we'll find a way to trigger this in our thing. All right, now let's see. Okay. So we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. And the reason we're not there yet is because we're not updating our balance to include the interest. One more um, alteration, and this is, uh, so equals, current balance plus our, so we don't actually, yeah, let's, we probably just need to have it equal to current balance plus current balance times interest because we didn't assign that specific value to a variable. And then we should be good. One more time as a moichido, um, one more time, okay. Let's see, crossing my fingers because I want to go to bed. <laughs> and let's see, it's like it's it's hidden for the big reveal. And there we go, we're down to zero dollars. And uh, yeah, so what we'll do next in the next video, because we also still have to create our loan object and then pull this into um, access, but for the next video, we will see if we can put some variability in here, make these, uh, maybe put the actual worksheet functions that reference the cells that we can then do live calculations, add an alternative row, um, alternative column, just like we did uh, with this sheet here, and then maybe also add some formatting. So that'll be in the next video, but you can see how quick and easy this is. And if I wanted to now, I could have a uh, car, I'm just gonna, car loan. I'm just gonna do car loan three. And what I'm gonna actually do here is uh, drag that down and then we'll just sort of drag this down. It's gonna be kind of nonsense in what we see here. But the idea is that I can now take this code and I should be able to generate all of those sheets in a flash with all of those values. So this is the power of VBA. This is what we can do, and it can be pretty amazing. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I know it was kind of long. I, I hope I kept your interest throughout there. I know I stumbled a bit. Um, honestly, though, yeah, it is long. But let me know what you think in the comments section. Let me know if this is a good format, if it's something you're interested in. Um, I, would have liked to harp on a few more things like the ability to pause and pick up anywhere, but we're all adults. We know what we can do. Uh, we know that if we like the content, but we need a break, we can self-discipline, right? But yeah, I'm really, I, I think, I'm hoping this is useful. Hope I explain the concepts well enough and I hope I can continue to share my knowledge with you all and hopefully have some fun doing it. So thank you for watching and I'm gonna call it and have a good day. This is Crazy Talk Analytics.